Oh, what's up, Booth homies? It's your boy Nathan, charismatic character, reporting to you from the Booth of Truth. We're in the book Our Threatened Freedom, a series of 155 radio addresses from around three minutes to four minutes long each. And we're in section, a series, pardon me, two. And number six, let's go. Six. Did the Romans and do the Americans love virtue? The early Roman love of virtue gave way in time to a love of evil. Not many Romans, however, like to admit that this had happened. Instead of an open love for evil, they disguised their taste for sin with a supposed desire to expose wrongdoings. As a result, exposés of evil in high places became very popular. Writers, both important and unimportant, found that the sins of the high and mighty made for a large readership. Most Romans loved to profess outrage over the sins of the mighty, when in fact they envied them. Writers like Tacitus, Suetonius and others had a ready market for their accounts of sin in high places. Senate investigations also became popular. Every time there was a hearing on evil in public office, many people assumed that a great forward step had been taken. The false assumption was very widespread that condemning evil made a man righteous. This is a dangerous belief. No man becomes righteous or moral by condemning sin in other people. The Bible tells us in Psalm what blah blah. The Bible tells us in Psalm eleven seven, the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. We are not told that God blesses men for their interest in evil, but only when they are righteous. Deuteronomy 28 Today, this feeling of the Romans is our feeling also. We have come to believe that our denunciation of evil means righteousness on our part, and we have men on the left and right of political issues who think they are good because they are loud in denouncing evil. More than a few periodicals have been very successful like many politicians, simply for exposing and denouncing evil. Well, Rome always had a loud chorus of denouncers and perished all the same. Then, as now, the ability to investigate, denounce and condemn evil is no guarantee of righteousness. The Romans of old, like Americans of today, loved to see evil exposed, They love to talk about national scandals. Evil is interesting to most people, whereas righteousness is not. At a dinner party, a suddenly disgusted host said, Let's stop all this talk about scandals and evils. Let's talk about something good for a change. The result was a painful silence. No one was interested in talking about righteousness. But... Freedom rests on righteousness or justice. Without righteousness, freedom perishes. All right. Let's try a couple more, shall we? That's good. Seven. Do we want to be lied to? The Vietnam War has been over for some years and American troops have returned home to be forgotten. But one story from that war still remains in my mind. A young Marine loaded with morphine was carried into the Da Nang Marine Hospital. Both his legs were gone, but he did not know it. He became conscious briefly and saw a chaplain standing over him. He asked the chaplain, Are my legs okay? Sure, said the chaplain, although he knew better. 
By the next day, the young Marine knew better, and when the chaplain came by, he called him the dirtiest name he could think of. It's a hard story to forget. I thought of it again when I heard someone who manages political campaigns say that if people want to be lied to, and too much truth-telling is a good way to lose elections. Very few people, he said, really want to know how bad things are. Is this true? Do we want to be lied to? Well, all too often I am told, don't tell mum that dad is dying, or don't tell my parents that my brother is dying, and so on. A friend of mine, knowing economics, predicted to his relatives what would happen to our economy and to their investments. They refused to listen to him. When he turned out to be right, they turned on him, saying, It's people who talk like you who make mad... It's people like you. It's people who talk like you who make bad things happen. I know several ministers who lost churches for dealing very biblically and patiently with the sins of the congregation. One vicious reprobate stood up in a congregational meeting and called to dismiss the pastor, declaring, His preaching doesn't make me feel good. Given the flagrant sins of that man, no true preaching would ever make him feel good. All too many people want lies that make them feel good. The prophet Isaiah spoke of an evil generation which demanded of God's prophets, Speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit, Isaiah 30.10. But lies are the death of truth and freedom. People who want to be lied to are candidates for defeat and slavery. Do you want to be lied to, or do you want the truth? Do you shut the door on unpleasant facts and try to put a good front on things? The Pharisees of old tried to whitewash evil, but it did not work then, nor will it work now. Faith and freedom require of us a love for the truth and a rejection of lies. There is no comfort in a lie, only bitterness. The chaplain who lied to the Marine did not restore his legs with his lie, He did destroy the trust between them and all future relationship. Okay, well that was hard hitting as always. So nice. Nice and nice. Eight. Do we want a monopoly in education? Try again. It. Do we want a monopoly in education? A step was proposed by the Ontario government in Canada, which some believe the United States will also take before too long. The Ontario legislature considered a bill which would make it illegal for anyone but a state-operated university to grant degrees. Presbyterian Journal, July 30th, 1986. Similar efforts have been made in the United States with respect to children's homes, nurseries, grade schools and high schools. Basic to these efforts is the belief that only the state is competent to pass judgment on or to produce quality educational institutions. Sorry. <laughs> ah, that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> or produce quality educational instructions. 
The sad fact is that state institutions are far from the best and are often the worst. State accreditation is no evidence of quality. Often it means the reverse. Some of our most famous private universities, like Harvard, have never been accredited. Why should they submit to their inferior... Why should they submit... Submit... Why should they submit to their inferiors? Why should they submit to their inferiors? The idea that the state has some special wisdom which enables it to pass judgment on everything is a dangerous doctrine. The state is not God, nor does it have any special competence or wisdom. If the Ontario measure passes, every Christian college in Ontario and every private college will become illegal. Education, like the postal service, will become a state monopoly. Few things are more arrogant and inefficient than a true monopoly. It has an enforced power and a guaranteed market. Quality becomes less and less a consideration. All over the world, however, civil government are where blah, blah, blah. flow, flow, flow. All over the world, however, civil governments are working to gain a monopoly control over education, economics, planning, and more. Another word for this is totalitarianism. To gain this control, statists warn of abuses in the private sector. These abuses are sometimes real and sometimes invented. We regularly read about bureaucratic charges against some private agency, but we too seldom read when these charges are proven false. Such stories are backpage news at best. Meanwhile, the closer the state comes to gaining a monopoly over any area, the more corrupt its performance becomes and the more incompetent. The goal of status controls is not better service, but greater power. Education was once entirely controlled by the non-status sector. The state was a complete outsider to the school. By its entrance into education, the state gained a power of mind control over the younger generation, and this power is increasingly used to foster statism, not freedom. We have gained by the separation of church and state. Why shouldn't we again have a separation of school and state? It is necessary for the preservation of freedom. I think we'll um, go ahead and try the following chapter, shall we? Twelve. Let's not, let's not. Okay, thanks for tuning in and uh, appreciate um, you being with me virtually in the booth of truth. So it is. Um, Yeah, if you're interested in supporting this project of putting all Rushduni's work on Audible, that's already published on Amazon. And more. There's more in the works. There's more coming. Um... That would be great. Uh, you can do so by liking, sharing, commenting, messaging me. And if you'd like to help me do more better work, then consider giving. And you can give either one off or make a regular donation at nathanteacher.com forward slash donations. Thank you very much and see you soon.